Finally, an excuse to play every single Kirby game. It's the 30th anniversary this year, and I wanted to rank each game based on how fun they are. I'm counting every core Kirby title, as well as the spin-offs, remakes, e-cards, and compilations because I'm an overambitious piece of shit. With that said, let's get her ranked. 37, Kirby Slide Puzzle. Do the Kirby Slide. This card contains a free game. Damn right I'm counting this as a Kirby game. In comparison to everything else, it's the worst one because it's just a slide puzzle. And there's only one picture of Kirby to solve over and over again. I mean, I like the e-card. It's got Kirby and Sonic on it, so I'm pretty happy about that. If you're wondering why this even exists, it was basically just promo material for the Kirby Right Back At You TV show. It was distributed through Toys R Us and Nintendo Power, just to give you an idea of how obscure this game is. 36. Kirby's Pinball Land. I have no idea what the consensus is on pinball nowadays, but I've always kind of hated them. It feels like no matter how well you time the ball, it goes in whatever direction it feels like, and that's especially true with wonky Game Boy game movement. The physics are at least consistent, but they're very hard to get used to. I will give the game credit for having some pretty decent chip tunes, as well as cool looking boards. There's only three available, plus the final boss at the end. The poppy board has a section with Frosty, but it mostly features the bomb fellas. The top of this board is just obnoxious. You have to break these three eggs before the Poppy Brothers come down and replace the egg? Or fix it? I don't know exactly what they're doing, but you basically have to free the chicken, which takes you to the boss. Krako's board has a bunch of cloud-themed areas, but Scarfy is on the bottom, and to escape, you have to bust him into three and then land on the top Scarfy to launch up. This was a pain in the ass, but the boss fight was pretty straightforward. The Wispy board wasn't that bad either, and the final boss is hitting King Dedede in a boxing ring. There's also bonus stages that show up periodically for more points, and you've got a live system for some reason. It's completely pointless because the boards are so tiny, and you don't save progress anyway. If you get a game over, you just restart your high score. I honestly found the entire game to be extremely aggravating. Being at a boss and falling down the hole sends you back to the previous board, which is nothing short of painful. You can't collect maximum tomatoes to save some falls, but it really feels out of your control half the time. I don't know, maybe I just suck at pinball, but I had almost no fun playing it. 35. Kirby Tilt and Tumble. By far, one of the most interesting Kirby games out there. To control the pink fella, you literally have to tilt your Game Boy Color to move. Flicking up lets Kirby jump, and that's basically the controls. You'll sometimes push A to launch off cannons, but it's really that simplified. And let me emphasize Game Boy Color, by the way, because the tilt sensor is in the cartridge. You can't use a Game Boy Advance or Game Boy Advance SP because the cart has to be upright in a very specific way. You could technically try this on a Game Boy player if you really wanted a spicy gaming session, so uh, have fun with that I guess. Here's the thing, even if you do manage to get your hands on this game and it works, it's a nightmare playing it without a backlit screen. Like, I had to turn on my studio light just so I could somewhat see what was happening. This alone kills the game for me. And it's only a problem because I have to keep moving the screen around. I can't keep the screen in my focus in one spot. Now, sure, you could emulate this on something else, but this experience is so unique that it feels like it has to be played on the original hardware. And it's really not fun when I can barely see the action on screen. But I have to give credit where credit is due. The motion controls are extremely responsive, like they actually work. Tilt and Tumble even attempted voice clips. Which are atrocious, but I appreciate the effort. And can we just talk about the save screens? They're all big ass pictures of Curb, and we cycle through a bunch of different faces. The levels are surprisingly well put together too. They've got a pretty good difficulty curve and all try new things. But man, this game is hard as a freaking boulder. I mean, seriously, good luck beating this even if you are emulating it and can see what you're doing. You drown in the water after a few seconds, these pegs have to be hit in a quick time frame and it's painful, there's slippery ice stages, narrow platform stages, slow-ass blockbot stages, this game is a fascinating piece of history, but there's no reason to play it nowadays. This would be perfect to port onto the Switch, actually, since gyro controls are already built into the controllers. 
34, Team Kirby Clash Deluxe. Oh boy, a free to start game. It's not as bad as it sounds, but just the fact that there's gameplay centric microtransactions knocks this down as one of the worst Kirby games based on sheer principle. But we'll get into that in a bit. I do want to talk about the actual game because it is enjoyable. If you played Team Kirby Clash from Planet Robobot, it's the same sub game but with more to do. You'll fight bosses with up to four players using one copy ability, and when it's defeated, you get experience points to level up your stamina, attack power, and the like. So it's basically an action RPG, but Kirbyified. You can also upgrade your weapons, armor, use support items. It's a recipe for a decent game. There's also several locations and different enemies to fight, all of them coming from Planet Robobot. It is a little disappointing that there's still only four roles to pick from. They didn't add a single new one. But the gem apples are new, and they're what you'll use to upgrade your gear, buy support items, and increase the likelihood of getting elemental fragments. These fragments are essential to upgrading your gear, and if you take too long to fight an enemy or everyone dies, you have to use gem apples to add time or revive your team. So, if you can't tell, gem apples are extremely important. You get apples for free by playing normally, but also coming back to the game every day from this tree. The problem is the quantity of apples is a negligible amount if not leveled up. So to actually finish the game without several weeks or months of grinding, you need to spend money on all the sales and buy the 2150 gem apple set to max out the tree. With this, you'll get 4 450 apples every 12 hours, which is enough to beat the game in a couple of weeks. So the game essentially caps you out on spending money, which might sound like a good thing. But here's my question. Why not just sell the damn game up front? Is it because they thought they couldn't sell this smaller title at 40 bucks? Because I'll be honest, the $7 I paid was the amount I felt it was actually worth. So they're trying to squeeze a full game's worth of money out of us for less, and that is gross. I know microtransactions are a common practice now, but I hate how normalized it's become, especially when it ruins the fun factor in a game. 33. DDD's Drum Dash Deluxe I doubt many of you remember this one either, because it's another expansion, but from Kirby Triple Deluxe's subgame, DDD's Drum Dash. The only difference is there's more stages, which still isn't a lot. You've got seven stages total, plus secret versions with remixed music. There's two main reasons I don't really care for this game. One, the price is way too steep. And look, I don't usually factor in costs when ranking video games, but like, it's seven bucks. You'll beat this entire game in like 30 minutes, maybe an hour hour if you go for gold medals. It's worth more like $3 in my opinion. And two, I really didn't care that much for the music, which was the main problem. Now don't get me wrong, I was bopping it out to Meta Knight's Revenge, but everything else was just okay. The gameplay is at least kind of interesting, you bounce around on drums and have to collect coins without taking damage. You move freely and have to time out high in super jumps. So it combines rhythm and platforming into one, and that's pretty neat, but man, there really just wasn't enough songs for the price, and I didn't really really find any of them that great to begin with. 32. Kirby's Dream Land. It's Kirby's first core adventure, and it'll take you less than an hour to beat. It's on the Game Boy, so that's completely fine. The only thing is there's no copy abilities. You basically just eat enemies and spit them back out. This is obviously not the most creative gameplay loop of all time. In fact, it gets old kind of quickly, and the game chugs along too. I imagine eating enemies and spitting them out is a lot for a little whittle Game Boy to handle, and for what it's worth, the levels generally try different things and all have distinct themes. So you gotta give credit where credit is due. It's just not a title that's worth playing more than once. But if you did, there's an extra mode you can try which makes the game harder. A lot of the enemies are replaced with much more difficult ones, and the bosses are more enduring. So it's fine and all, it just hasn't aged gracefully. 31. Kirby's Blowout Blast, or as I like to put it, the Sonic 3D Blast of Kirby games. It's neat to finally have 3D levels to roam around in. They'll suck up all the baddies in order to get to the end of the stage. This is another expanded sub-game from Kirby Planet Robobot, and I like the idea, but there's very little to get excited about. The main reason is there's zero copy abilities. You just inhale enemies and spit them back out to score combos. What you've seen in this gameplay so far is basically the entire game. And look, it's not like there isn't fun to be had, I enjoyed seeing Chonky Kirby and jamming out to the great music, but man, what a missed opportunity to not include some variety. Even the levels themselves all look the same aside from changing colors. The only thing that freshens up the gameplay are some of the bosses. Lolo Lo and La 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 make an appearance, which is pretty obscure, but honestly, I have to look at this game as a tech demo more than anything. A boring experiment that's laying the groundwork for a proper 3D game. 30. Kirby Battle Royale No, you don't drop out of the Kirby bus and squad up to get that victory royale. This is actually a minigame collection. 
Yeah, really. The minigames themselves are fine, but not much tie them together. There is a story mode where King DDD somehow makes these clones of Kirby's, and then you basically just play the minigames a bunch to win. It's really not much of an incentive for me to want to play, if I'm being honest. And even weirder, half the minigames are really similar to each other. You've got Apple Scramble and Coin Clash, where you basically just collect the things, but with Apple Scramble you put them in a certain spot. Then Rocket Rumble and Ore Express are basically the same. Collect the green thingies and put them somewhere to win. Attack Riders and Robobonkers' only difference is that you attack a robot and Robobonkers instead of the other players. Battle Arena is a free-for-all fight, which is alright for a little bit. Crazy Theater reminds me a lot of WarioWare since you kind of play micro games, but there's way less variety and it's much slower. Then Slam Hockey is probably my favorite of the bunch. You whack a puck around so it's your color, and hitting other players gives you points. Finally, you've got Flag Ball, which will send the ball to the other team's flag. This is another decent one. I don't know why Nintendo had this obsession with releasing so many Kirby games on the 3DS. It's like they just wanted to test if 3D Kirby would work like 80 times first. I should also point out that there's an online mode, but you can't play with your friends directly, which is really odd. And there's also amiibo support. And I'm only bringing this up because the freaking QB amiibo works with it. The most valuable amiibo gives him this little hat, which I think is worth pointing out. If you really like Kirby, you'll probably like this game, but there are better options. 29. Kirby Canvas Curse Because of course there had to be a Kirby DS game that only controls with a touchscreen. You'll draw lines to move Kirby around the screen. Tapping him gives him a little boost to hit enemies and gain speed. It's a simple enough concept, and you can still get a handful of copy abilities too. I found Beam and Wheel to be the most useful, while the other ones were just okay. And honestly, I was enjoying the game at first. It looks really nice, and the music has this really hard, almost electronic sound to it. The controls are fairly intuitive, or at least that's what I thought at first. The first red flag came when I played a water level. Now, duh, most water levels are slow and tedious, but Canvas Curse is on another level. Kirby's gravity is flipped in water, which I guess means he's really light. Anyway, since he floats up, trying to navigate in the water is just awful. There's a good chance I was just doing something wrong, but man, the water levels just got harder and harder, and it felt like it was because of the touchscreen. Kirby just wouldn't build up speed. And yes, I know loops give him speed, but that's not easy to do when half the corridors are filled with spikes and you can only draw so much at a time. Once I got to World 6, I dreaded finishing this game, and there were only six levels plus the final boss. But all six of them got harder and harder. And I would have loved this if it were a normal Kirby game where I actually felt like I was in control of what I was doing, but that's not the case when Kirby decides to change direction when I draw a line the wrong way by necessity. Speaking of bosses, the only one is the final boss. Everything else is just minigames, which are also the subgames, so that's a little bizarre. These subgames are fine. Cracko, you're basically playing Arkanoid, King DDD requires you to eat more food than him while avoiding enemies, and then Paint Roller makes you draw really fast and tap blocks at the end. They're very forgettable to say the least. I really wish I liked this game more. It was one that I eyed as a kid and just never picked up. It's just aggravating how the one time a Kirby game actually gets challenging, it uses a gimmick for the sake of being a gimmick. 28. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse I mean, I guess it's better than Canvas Curse. The game looks absolutely stunning. Their creative approach really paid off and is obviously an improvement to the DS game. Now, like many others have complained about, it does suck that you can't experience Rainbow Curse's beauty properly. Since it's all touchscreen, you have to look at the gamepad the entire time. It still looks nice on there, but it's just not the same. Although this game technically is an all touchscreen because there is a co-op mode where a second player can be Waddle Dee. This is honestly hilarious because Waddle Dee can just pick up Kirby and play most of the level on his own. It's like the devs knew this game wasn't that great, so there's kind of an option to just play normally. There's also a few other changes worth bringing up too, like there's more than one boss. Yeah, there's four of them, and three basically repeat themselves twice. I know, they were uh, really wilding out this time. And then there's the final boss. And for some reason, this final boss, Clacia and Dark Crafter, is simply fantastic. The touchscreen is used in such a fair yet challenging way. You gotta knock back bombs at Clacia to remove her shield, and then for Dark Crafter, you fly around as a missile and build up stars to use a charge attack. It's one of the few times the game feels genuinely fun, because it really isn't half the time. Like Canvas Curse, the last few worlds are just miserable. Like last time, the water levels are extremely awkward to navigate. They still have the flipped gravity bullshit. 
but the levels are slightly more tolerable for one reason, and that's the gamepad itself. Because of the wider screen, it's a little bit easier to see what's coming up, and your hand doesn't get in the way as often. Worlds 5 through 7 are frustrating for all the same reasons as before, and some of the levels are even worse. Like, there's one in World 7 where you have to be in this blue light to wait for platforms to move, and what's annoying about that is Kirby coming to a full stop requires vertical lines or holding him down. It's just more irritating than it needs to be. For 6-1, the game asked if I wanted to skip the level, and guess what? I f did because I was fed up with it, and I never give up on levels unless I feel like it's out of my control. The music really isn't that great either. Like, yeah, you can unlock some great remixes, but in-game, most of it is very forgettable. The invincibility music, as an example, is awful. Take a listen. Yeah, why is it so... calming? It makes no sense. On top of that, you can no longer stun enemies by tapping. You have to tap Kirby to attack. I thought I was going to hate this change, but honestly, it didn't make much of a difference. But what did is the lack of copy abilities. They removed them entirely and replaced them with three transformations that show up periodically. Kirby Tank is awful. He's so freaking slow that I'd fall asleep if there weren't so many enemies to take out. Submarine Kirby is fine. You'll tap to move him through the water, and frankly, I wish that's how Kirby controlled in general. Then Kirby Rocket is probably the best. He continuously moves in one direction and is much easier to waggle around. So they're just okay replacements. But what about the other modes? Well, there's challenge mode. You get chest and tiny levels as fast as you can. And that's it. There's no sub games. And the only other thing to do is look at the figurines and listen to the music you've collected. I honestly hope we never get another Kirby game like this. I'm pretty over them for like forever at this point. 27. Kirby Fighters Deluxe Like DDD's Drum Dash, Kirby Fighters also has an expansion. It's probably still not worth it for the price, but at least there's more stuff to do. It's basically a light version of Smash Bros, but with a damage meter instead of racking up percent. Kirby Fighters Deluxe adds team battles, as well as a few new stages. The single player is very similar to Classic Mode in Smash Bros. You go through a series of rounds where you'll fight other Kirbys, bosses, and team fights. The combat is pretty simple. You basically pick a copy ability and stick with it for the entire duration. Finishing single player rewards you with an alt-colored hat, which for this game isn't that interesting, but damn would this be amazing for Smash Bros. Imagine unlocking alt costumes for getting certain scores in classic mode, home run contest, multi-man, that would be sick, but I'm way off topic now. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of strategy unless you're playing with hazards and items off. So I guess again, that's akin to Smash Bros, but the odds of getting friends together to play multiplayer seriously is slim to none. And even then, you have very little attack options, so there wouldn't be much point. The items come from Triple Deluxe, which is a fun nod, and the music is pretty solid. I really don't like the stage hazards. You got hands that push you towards the front of the screen, these hammers that smash down, and entire bosses just attacking. It's a bit much, but for what this game is, it's alright. 26. Kirby's Avalanche. Wow, it's Puyo Puyo. Puyo Puyo. At Kirby, would, Kirby would say that. And I mean that quite literally, but with some Kirby sprites thrown in and remix music. If you've never played Puyo Puyo, the idea is to match up four of the same colored blobs for them to disappear. If you already like this puzzle game, then you'll probably like Kirby's Avalanche. This one isn't really for me. I'm more of a Tetris guy myself. I just like hearing Kirby talk. Waddle D. I mean, just perfection, isn't it? 25. Kirby Star Stacker. Look at that cute little wave on the title screen. Best game ever, just like that. So this is another puzzle game. The main idea is to make matches of two or more, but matches don't work with stars. To get rid of those, you have to make the same kind of matches with stars in between the animals so they'll disappear. Of all the puzzle games I've played in my life, I don't think I've tried one quite like this. So points for being something different. It can be a bit addicting to play too. It's got some decent music and a few different modes. This is one of those games that I would love to play again if it were remastered on modern hardware, but probably won't go back to because it's on the Game Boy. Honestly, I just liked all the adorable Kirby art. 24. Kirby's Dream Course People tend to shit on the Virtual Console Switch Online, but I have to admit that I would never have had the pleasure of playing Kirby's Dream Course multiplayer without it. It calls itself a golf game, but it's so drastically different that it's honestly in its own category. You do technically still get Kirby into the hole, but the game throws in copy abilities and enemies to spice things up. And actually, there is no hole until all but one enemy is defeated. That's when it spawns. This is an amazing concept for a golf game, because 
because you can never really anticipate where the hole is going to be exactly. It's a fine enough single player game, but it really shines when playing with someone else. I can't tell you how much fun it is trying to beat your friend into getting into a hole first, or psyching them out with which enemies you're going to hit. It's a great time if you're playing in two player, but otherwise there isn't much else here. 23. Super Kirby Clash Wow, it's the third time Team Kirby Clash has been reiterated, but now it's on the Switch in glorious HD. Right off the bat, I noticed the game runs at 30 frames per second. It's not the end of the world, but the previous two games were running in 60 frames, and some of the menus run in 60, so it's a bit of an awkward scenario. There's also barely any new content outside of more missions, stickers in the item shop, and some new bosses. However, you probably won't need to buy any gem apples because of Party Quest. This is an online mode where you can play the game with friends or random people, and you get a separate Viger for both. So by playing offline and online, and thanks to the bevy of new missions, you probably won't find a reason to buy any microtransactions. So at least that's something you don't have to worry about. I still think it's ridiculous that they didn't add a single new role again. It's the same four from the previous two games, but whatever at this point, the game is still fun for what it is, and this is the best version of this Kirby Clash subseries. 22. Kirby's Dream Land 2 I'm still blown away that this is running on a Game Boy. Dream Land 1 seemed to barely work and was so limited, and Dream Land 2 came out after Kirby's Adventure and managed to include copy abilities. There may only be 8, but that is one hell of an achievement. The technical prowess it must have taken for this to work is simply immaculate. And honestly, the game itself is pretty solid too. It's so much better than the first Dream Land. It's definitely still laggy, which is a bit annoying, but I can forgive it. There's also animal friends you can ride on, and if you have a certain copy ability, it alters their power. The best part is you can bring the animals from level to level. They don't just leave once you exit. The animal friends are definitely the highlight. It's really too bad they're barely used anymore. Dreamland 2 is still a pretty short game, but at least it's twice as long as the first Dreamland, which is very respectable for the handheld it's on. There's no extra hard mode, and there aren't really sub games, but you can replay most of the bosses and collect all the stars on their stage. If you do this, you add to your save file completion, and at 100%, you'll unlock the mode bonus chance and boss endurance in the menu. So they kind of skimped on the sub games, which honestly is fine. For Game Boy, there's plenty to play here as it is. And let's not forget that one of the stage maps looks like this. Just figured I'd throw that out there. 21. Kirby's Block Ball what happens when you combine Kirby and Breakout? You get a surprisingly fantastic Game Boy game that I slightly prefer over Dreamland 2. I'm not even joking, I actually had more fun with this. If you already like Breakout, then you're gonna really enjoy this one since Kirby can use abilities as if they were power-ups. Spark lets you pass through blocks faster, Needle lets you stick to your paddle, and so on. Each level not only has different designs, but the amount of paddles you use changes constantly. Sometimes you'll have to move two at once, sometimes four, and sometimes just one side as spikes, which is the only thing that takes your lives. Moving multiple paddles is easier than you'd think. Going left and right moves top and bottom, and up and down moves the sides. It's strangely intuitive, and while the paddle is pretty small, the hitbox is very generous, so small errors usually don't punish you. By pushing A when Kirby is near the paddle, it makes him bigger, which does more damage to blocks, but also protects Kirby against the spikes. You may think that this would make Kirby's block ball too easy, but you have to time your A press very carefully or it won't work. So there's a very fair balance at stake. I died several times and it always felt like it was my own undoing and not a stroke of bad luck. The bosses are really cool, the game looks decent, and the music is amazing. It's criminal that none of the music has ever been recreated officially. All of it is super catchy and some of the best chip tunes I've heard in a long while. Give this game a try and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. It's just too bad it's on the Game Boy. 20. Kirby Fighters 2 Because why not, said Nintendo probably. As you can guess by now, this is a reboot of sorts to Kirby Fighters Deluxe. And of all the expansions from the original 3DS titles, this is the best one. First off, it looks great and it runs at 60 FPS. Since this is a fighter game, I'm glad we're finally getting that. There's actually quite a few new things to bring up too, although the gameplay itself is relatively the same. We've got a more proper story mode now, where you'll climb up a tower fighting harder and harder characters. In between each bout, you'll select items to help boost your play like auto guard or an attack stone, and it's a pretty fun mode and all. Again, there's just not much to add that hasn't already been said. There's some new stages which is pretty cool, and there's also online. I tried that, and was shocked to not only find players, but the connections seem to be pretty good. And we can't forget Wrestler Kirby, who actually debuted in this spin-off game. I hope we get him in a core game someday because he's just awesome. You can also play as other characters like Waddle D, Meta Knight, and a few others. Of all the sub-games that got expansions, I'd just try out this one. The other ones are alright, but there's actually a lot to do in Kirby Fighters 2. If I had more time, I could probably be into this for a good while. 
19. Kirby's Adventure, seen as the one that started it all. Although Kirby's Dream Land technically came before it, Kirby's Adventure essentially transformed Kirby into what it is today, with the introduction to copy abilities. This was revolutionary, and still is an amazing idea for a game. Eat an enemy that has a certain power, and gain its abilities right on the spot. It's pretty damn sweet. And for the NES, the game still looks pretty decent. The colors are a little washed out, but there's lots of them. HAL Laboratory was clearly pushing the NES to its limits. Speaking of limits, the gameplay is not the greatest, especially on the original hardware. It is ridiculously laggy, which makes sense because of how much is happening on screen, but the lag does dampen the pacing and gameplay, which is unfortunate because it was such a massive step for the franchise. Thankfully, the game has been remade a couple times, which we'll get into later on. There's also an extra mode, which gives you half the hit points, and you can't save your progress. I didn't see much of a reason to play this, it doesn't really change anything about the game itself, and the sub-games are fine, I didn't really find a compelling reason to play Crane Fever or Quick Draw more than once. Egg Catcher is kind of fun though, you eat as many eggs as you can and avoid all the bombs. It's got a bit of an addicting quality to it since there's a sense of rush to snipe all the eggs. But yeah, there's not much of a reason to play this version of Kirby's Adventure when remasters exist. 18. Kirby Air Ride Well, this one is striving for originality. It's a racer like no other, for better or for worse. You've got three modes, Air Ride, Top Ride, and City Trial. Air Ride is technically the main part of the game. There's nine different tracks and 14 vehicles to pick from. This track selection is just puny, especially for GameCube standards. F-Zero GX and even Double Dash had a bigger selection than this. The vehicles, however, are where things get interesting. Each one controls differently, and I mean very, very differently. The Warp Star kind of behaves like normal, the Wagon Star doesn't charge, the Swerve Star can only turn when it comes to a complete stop, the Slick Star has really slippery handling. I don't know why the vehicles have such extreme differences, it just makes the entire game feel unbalanced. What ends up happening is you'll find a few machines you like, and the rest of them you'll never touch again. The controls are also ridiculously oversimplified. You steer with a joystick, and the A button does everything else. Inhale enemies with A, brake with A, charge up a drift with A, hit the speed boost with A, like, I get it, Kirby is supposed to be simple, but this is to a point where it makes the game more annoying than it needs to be. Sakurai, look at all these buttons, there's so many, so nice, use them, come on! You can also unlock King DD and Meta Knight, but those are the only other characters. And look, I'm just gonna say it, the copy abilities don't even feel that useful. Most of them are short range, so they aren't that practical. Now look, I've done a lot of bitching so far and have probably pissed off the super dedicated Kirby Air Ride fans, but even so, I still enjoy the racing. Once you do find a vehicle you like, the races themselves feel very cinematic. It's got to do with the way the camera's really zoomed in on you while the rest of the stage feels wide and open. It's strangely exhilarating. And we've also got the other modes, like top ride, and there's not much to say about it. You drive from a top-down perspective, and you'll be bored of it within 10 minutes. City Trial, of course, is what everyone raves about, and it's definitely the best part of Kirby Air Ride. You drive through the city and collect patches to enhance your vehicle. Then at the end, you'll use the enhancements to complete a final challenge, which is completely random every time. Sometimes you'll fight to the death of Destruction Derby, or glide off a ramp and go as far as you can, or even just fight King DDD. City Trial is a ton of fun with friends, and all the different environments lead to a lot of fun to be had. So I'm split on Kirby Air Ride. I really like the ideas and City Trial, of course, but a lot of the execution falls flat or isn't expanded on enough. 17. Kirby Mass Attack The only game where you can go inside King Dedede's crotch. Aw yeah. This is another touch-controlled Kirby game, but it's actually pretty solid. Yeah, they didn't completely mess up the controls this time. Instead of being forced to guide Kirby with lines using his momentum, you just tap or drag a warp star around the screen to move the Kirbys. And yes, not just one Kirby, up to 10 most of the time. You'll tap enemies to attack them, and swipe a Kirby to send them flying up or down. You can also draw circles and lines to group the Kirbys together and send them a certain direction. This control scheme is infinitely more intuitive than Canvas Curse. I'm kind of shocked that nobody talks about this game because it's very much under the radar. In order to get more Kirbys, you have to eat a bunch of fruit, and getting 100 points adds another one to your team. So while this drives incentive to eat the fruit, that really only works until you have all 10 Kirbys. After that, the game just pauses and gives you a score boost, and the pausing is a little annoying at times. There's really only a few downsides to this game. For one, the levels feel too long. A lot of 
sometimes you get a good grasp on the new gimmick, and then the level just keeps going for another 10 to 15 minutes. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, some people may actually like the longer levels, but they do tend to feel a little bit overdrawn. The concept of Kirby attacking and moving with a touchscreen does get old as well, but near the end of the game, new ideas are brought to the table which help alleviate this issue. My favorite level being this tank one, where you'll fire your team of Kirby as fireballs to get through the level. I also love the Wispy Woods level, where he's an obstacle instead of a boss, and you have to ride his trunk over some water, it's actually pretty innovative. This game reminds me of Kirby's Epic Yarn, because it's not really a Kirby game. There's no copy abilities, and you don't puff up in the air, which are two huge traits of the puffball. With that said, this game is a lot tougher than that one. I found myself scrambling to keep all my Kirbys alive, as if they were Pikmin. In fact, this game is also like a weird version of Pikmin in a lot of ways, at least when it comes down to how you'll throw Kirby around to solve puzzles or beat up enemies. Now, par usual, there's a bunch of sub games to play. In fact, this game is loaded with them, and you unlock them by collecting medals throughout each level. Honestly, though, most of them aren't worth your time. Field Frenzy, Dash Course, Kirby Brawl Ball, and Kirby Curtain Call are one and done deals. Straddle Patrol, on the other hand, is one of my favorite sub games of all time. It's a 20 minute space shooter where you'll collect Kirby's to get stronger and defeat enemies and bosses. The main challenge is that dragging the Kirby's around the screen is a little laggy, so you have to prepare for that ahead of time, and it's actually really fun. But this mode was just screaming to have copy abilities as different power ups for the Kirby's, like every other space shooter has. Then there's also Kirby Quest. It boils down to just tapping the screen at the right time, but it's framed as if it's an RPG. It's not really at all, but I do like the idea of a proper Kirby RPG in the future. I honestly hope they go back to exploring this kind of idea without the touchscreen, because it's got a lot of potential. 16. Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards If I remember correctly, this was the first Kirby game I ever played and beat. So while I have a soft spot for it, it's one of the more poorly aged titles. As you can see from this gameplay, the game moves at a snail's pace. I mean seriously, it feels like the N64 is going to catch on fire with all that 3D graphic processing power. This was technically the first core 3D Kirby, but it's played like a 2D platformer. And while it controls fine, the overall pacing feels really sluggish. It seems like it takes forever to attack sometimes, or even just run from point A to point B. It's also on the shorter side, which is acceptable because the graphical upgrade probably took a big toll of time to produce, but you can finish the whole game in a few hours. Don't get me wrong though, this game is still a lot of fun, especially since the big gimmick is combining abilities, and I mean that in the most direct sense. You can combine literally all of them into any combination you desire. So while the Crystal Shards technically only has 7 abilities, the combinations actually give you 35. Experimenting on the fly and learning about each of the combos is so enjoyable. It makes worth playing the entire game worth it. Burn plus Stone turns you into a volcano. Burn plus Bomb makes you fireworks. Burn plus Cutter gives you a huge sword. Stone plus Ice gives you a curling stone. Ice plus Bomb is an exploding snowman. I could go on for a while because these are by far the most creative abilities Kirby games have seen, even to this day. And the mini games are some of the best the entire franchise has to offer. 100 yard hop is a race to the finish while also avoiding puddles and other obstacles. Bumper crop bump is admittedly just okay. You collect falling crops and shove others around. But checkerboard chase, this mini game has no right to be this damn good. You basically obtain godlike powers and try to drop your opponents by clearing a row of blocks in front of you. I've popped in Kirby 64 just to play this mini game. It really is that addicting. There's so many mind games because you have to plan out when to attack, when to avoid the others, and the outside of the stage slowly closes in on you the longer you go. If Nintendo were to ever try to expand out a gimmick again, they should make Kirby 64 2 or even just a fully fledged version of Checkerboard Chase. 15. 3D Classics Kirby's Adventure It's exactly the same as the original Kirby's Adventure, but you can play it in 3D and it runs a lot smoother. I don't really care at all about the 3D, but the smoothed out gameplay really enhances the whole package. Some of the graphics have additional effects too, and a few random glitches were fixed. If you want to play the old school Kirby's Adventure, this is by far the best version. Hello, it's me, the Kirby guy. Okay, now you totally forgot to mention that this is actually the best Kirby game out there. Now I could be biased. This is one of my first games I've ever played ever, but man, you forgot about that one detail. Oh man, the world opening cutscenes. I always thought these were so neat and charming. They do a great job showing you what the levels are that you're about to head into. With this cute little Kirby cutscene, oh, it's so awesome. Other Kirby games would do this for sure, but other games of a similar style? Nah, this is mostly a Kirby exclusive idea. Aesthetically, I also always loved Orange Ocean. Something about the sunset on the water, especially on the NES. Ah, oh, this spoke to me and my heart in ways that no other game had done before when I was a kid. And even nowadays, it's beautiful. And also, since very few puzzles revolve around specific 
specific abilities, I always loved that Adventure says, hey, go free, go the entire game with basically any ability you want, no issues, just have fun. Great, 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 great stuff all around. Thanks, Ant Dude. Of course, man, no problem. 14. Kirby Star Allies. While this may be one of those by the number Kirby games, it's not as bad as some make it out to be. The big gimmick for this one is you can befriend enemies, which is a neat idea for what it's worth, but it makes an easy game even easier. In fact, this might be the easiest Kirby game of all time. Does the easiness make it bad? I mean, not really. I still had a good time playing through it, but there's definitely some portions that are tedious. You'll have more fun with multiplayer because the levels are better built for that, but single player wise, it's pretty average. Not not only can you befriend enemies now, but you can also play as them yourself. At launch, there weren't a lot of playable characters, but over time they added ones like Rick slash King slash Koo, Adeline, Magalore, Susie, and Gooey just to name a few. They all have their own movesets, so it's refreshing to have this many characters as well as this much fan service. And they even added a brand new mode later on called Heroes in Another Dimension. It's kind of like playing the story mode, but everything is more challenging, including the bosses. So yeah, this is one of those Switch games where the extra stuff was added several months later. I'm still not a fan of this method for releasing games, but I guess that's how things are just gonna work for the foreseeable future. I'd rather have the full experience right away, but that's just me. Star Allies is also the fourth game to have this art style, considering we had a return to Dreamland on the Wii in both of the 3DS games. Something I find really odd is the menus run at 60fps, while the game is at 30fps. It's not a deal breaker because platformers are playable at a lower frame rate, but it's a little jarring and a tad disappointing. What I do appreciate seeing return is combining copy abilities. It's not nearly as in-depth as Kirby 64, but I wouldn't expect that considering there's way more different types of abilities here. In fact, there's 28 copy abilities, which is a lot even for a Kirby title. Some of them return from previous games like Yo-Yo and Cleaning, and there are new ones including Artist, Festival, Spider, and Staff. Star Allies also has Buff DDD, so that alone adds value to the entire package. And you can even find a secret level, which is a remake of the first level from the very first Kirby game. We've talked a lot about the new game mode, but of course there's other modes too, like Guest Star, The Ultimate Choice, and a few sub-games. Guest Star is unlocked after being the main game, and you basically play an abridged version of the story mode with only a friend helper slash dream friend and not Kirby. The Ultimate Choice is a boss rush, but with multiple difficulty modes. Chop Champs and Star Slam Heroes are the only sub-games, and they're both very drab and forgettable. Even as someone that likes these kind of mini-games, I didn't see much of a point to play them more than once or twice. So despite Star Allies' baby difficulty, it at least has a lot of meaningful game modes and extra characters to romp around in. 13. Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland A remake of Kirby's Adventure was very much needed, and the Game Boy Advance one delivers on all fronts. The levels are pretty much the same. There's a couple of areas that are tweaked, but it's essentially the same game. The biggest difference being the controls and graphics. If you played Kirby in the Amazing Mirror, it feels exactly like that, which is much more accurate and responsive. I especially love all the background art. It looks like it was hand-painted with pastels and then carefully compressed down into a more pixelated form. One of the weirdest changes I noticed in Nightmare in Dreamland was the bosses. They function the same as before, but have zero hit stun now. If you have something like fire, spark, or ice, you can knock out anything in a matter of seconds, especially if it doesn't move very fast. It's kind of ridiculous how fast bosses go down. It's straight up comical in a sense. On top of the remake, you've still got the extra mode after beating the main game, but now you can unlock Boss Endurance and Meta Nightmare. Boss Endurance is your typical boss rush, while Meta Nightmare is the main game as Meta Knight. Normally, I don't care about playing as different characters characters in Kirby games, but goddamn is this mode addictive. Meta Knight can inhale enemies, but he has a sword and can move around at a zany pace. Meta Nightmare is timed and is meant to be played quickly. After finishing a stage, you're immediately kicked back into the hub world and just go to the next level. The fast nature is super satisfying, and it's harder too since you have half the hit points. All the mini games are also brand new, which is honestly a good change. Bomb Rally has you smacking a bomb around with four different Kirbys, Quick Draw is basically the same as the original game, and finally we've got Kirby air grind. You ride around on rails using a warp star, and it's a lot like the surfing minigame from Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. These sub-games are more enjoyable than the NES's counterparts, but there's still not something I'd spend more than 10 minutes playing. And I didn't even bring up that this game is 4-player compatible. I mean, geez, they really went all out here. 
12. Kirby Squeak Squad. Here's another Kirby title I grew up with, and was surprised with how well it's aged. I definitely see a lot more flaws 15 years later, but I had a great time from start to finish. You've probably noticed the graphics weren't updated from the Game Boy Advance. Yes, the screen size is bigger, but a lot of the assets are being reused, and it's running on the same engine. Personally, I love this art style, so I really didn't mind at all. The new copy abilities are either really great, or at the very least, memorable. The best one is probably Bubble, because you can attack enemies and turn them into bubbles and save their powers in your stomach. Oh yeah, you can hold five different items in your stomach on the bottom screen. It's a little weird and probably not necessary, but I really liked managing my health and abilities while playing through. But anyway, there's also the animal ability, in which you'll dig through dirt. This one is just decent if you ask me. And there's also Metal. You're invincible, but move as slow as a sloth. He's the definition of a tank. He'll never stop moving for anything. In Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, there were a bunch of treasure chests to find throughout the game, and Squeak Squad has many, many more to collect. At the end of each stage, a Squeak Squad member will try to grab the biggest chest, and you have to catch it first or they'll steal it and you'll be forced to fight them at their base to get the chest back. While it's a pretty cool concept, I very rarely struggle with grabbing the chest from them. Usually I just snoop in and run to the exit door with no trouble. Each treasure has a variety of collectibles. There are a ton of things to collect, maybe more so than usual. Also, something that's really odd is some of the levels are, like, ridiculously short. Short as in, the level is over in 30 seconds. I'm not sure if the developers were low on time or what happened, but it was a little strange playing these tiny bite-sized levels and then a normal-sized one. My favorite part of the game is combining power-ups. If you have the right combination, you can make elements for your sword and bombs. There's the fire sword, ice bombs, thunder bombs. It's not a lot, but it's really satisfying taking the time to create the combinations and using them. The sub-games are nothing special. They're honestly a bit weaker in comparison to the other games. With Smash Ride, you scrub Kirby across the screen to knock other players off, speedy tea time, you touch the cake before Storo does, and Trigger Shot is the same idea as Speedy Tea Time, but you swipe at the screen instead. So, it's not as amazing as I remembered it being, but it's still a pretty solid game in the series, and the Squeak Squad members are still an awesome addition. 11. Kirby's Epic Yarn I love that they went with Epic Yarn unironically, but the game is honestly pretty epic. Right away, I'm shocked to hear actual story narration in the beginning. It's very weird to hear proper words in a Kirby game, but I kind of like the change. Speaking of change, literally everything is made out of yarn, and it is absolutely adorable. The attention to detail is heartwarming. It's impossible to not go aww at least 20 times when playing through. The level design is what really keeps the game moving. There are so many clever aesthetic choices that make Kirby's Epic Yarn worth trying. It's definitely a bit slow at first, but once you get into World 2 and 3, the game really starts to shine and get creative. Another big change is there's no copy abilities, and infinite jumps are replaced with one big jump. That might not sound very Kirby to you, but believe me, it kind of is. Instead of eating enemies, you'll grab them with a yarn whip and roll them into a ball. This can be used to hit other enemies, open up passageways, and things like that. While I like this, it does get old after a while, but that's why you'll occasionally run into metamortex forms. These can take place as an entire level, or sometimes just randomly about, and I like these a lot. The dolphin makes swimming really slick, the fire engine puts out water, the off-roader lets you catch big air. Most of these forms are pretty sweet, except the train. You're forced to draw the train tracks with your Wii pointer, and the train is slow as ass, and I hated the couple levels it was in. Also, this is like the easiest video game of all time. There are no lives, and you can't can't take damage. Having no lives is great, because, let's be honest, it adds no value to games anymore, but not taking damage is maybe going too far. You do lose your gems, yes, but they don't make the game any harder. Personally, I would have preferred more challenging level design, but I also understand that this wasn't really the point. The idea is to explore the game at a leisurely pace, grab a cup of hot tea, and kick back on a rainy afternoon. Interestingly, there's very few bosses in comparison to most Kirby games, and the final boss is very anticlimactic. There's two different forms, and both of them take about 30 seconds to finish. So yeah, I really like this one for embracing a new aesthetic. It's just not quite as good as a top-tier Kirby title. However, you can collect furniture from each level and deck out your apartment for fun. And there's co-op, so you can't go wrong there. 10. Kirby's Extra Epic Yarn But is it really extra epic? I mean, it's a Wii game ported to the 3DS, so right off the bat, the game looks worse. It still plays perfectly fine and all, but the visual fidelity is definitely missed when that's a big part of the game. There's also no co-op, which is a little weird because New Super Mario Bros. 2 did that, but I guess it's not that big of a deal. The biggest change Extra Epic Yarn has is the Devilish Mode and Ravel abilities. Devilish Mode gives you a life bar, which is awesome, but also adds in a devil to annoy the crap out of 
of you. Why they couldn't have just included the life bar is beyond me, but honestly, it's nice to have difficulty options. And the Ravel abilities is a very bizarre choice. The game adds in six abilities. Wire is a sword, button is a bomb, nylon is a tornado, and so on. Now, I might have the opposing opinion here, but I actually really like these additions. Does it kind of defeat the purpose of the whole game? Yeah, a little bit, but does it improve the pacing and freshen things up? It absolutely does. And you don't even have to pick them up. It's still very possible to beat the whole game without these abilities. The last thing to mention is the extra two sub-games. DDD Go 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 has you dashing through levels collecting beads, then Slash and Bead is the same thing, but you stop to attack enemies. I'm really conflicted on which version I prefer. I think I have to give the edge to the 3DS one, but I totally get those of you that think the original is superior. 9. Kirby's Dream Land 3 One of the most forgotten about Kirby titles because Kirby Superstar overtakes it every time, and I don't think it's quite as good either, but it's absolutely worth playing. The biggest difference being the graphics. I mean, just look at this gorgeous pastel art style. The aesthetic is so perfect for Kirby, and even the animation is charming. The enemies and characters all have these little jiggles when standing idle or moving around. It really adds a lot to the tone of the art style. Like Dream Land 2, Animal Friends Return, but this time there's a total of 6. Rick, Ku and Kine are back, and new to the list are Nago a cat, Choo Choo an octopus, and Pitch a bird. All the animal friends are fun to use, especially the fish. I don't know what it is, but I just get a kick out of seeing Kirby's little head popping out of Kine's mouth. I will admit that a lot of times, the animal friends are more of a pain than a game. Some of them don't have multiple jumps, or are just really slow and bulky. It's also a little disappointing that copy abilities don't have multiple moves like they did with Superstar. I understand the need to downgrade because of all the animal friend combinations, but it's still a a little sad. The general gameplay is pretty well paced at least. When inhaling enemies, I noticed a much shorter pause time than normal. But then on the other hand, the screen takes a second to catch up to you sometimes? Yeah, Kirby will often run to the end of the screen before it starts to scroll with him. Like, how is this a problem not foreseen before release? But hey, at least you can find Metroids in this game! It's probably the coolest Kirby cameo I've ever seen. The music is amazing par usual. And man, the true final boss is something else. You fight a super big eyeball and it shoots blood at you in one of the phases. I never thought I'd see that in a Kirby game, let alone any Nintendo game, but yeah, this is a pretty great one. It's worth playing with the art style on its own. 8. Kirby's Return to Dream Land. Kirby drops his cake, and it's really sad. But anyway, the video game. It kind of feels like the new Super Mario Bros. of Kirby games, but in a really good way. It has an art style that's stuck around for several years, there's four-player co-op, it's really easy, like, it takes a lot of NSMB elements. Although, for being real, it was the first core Kirby game in a long time, so this was and still is refreshing to play. The jump from Kirby 64 to Return to Dream Land was pretty massive. The game runs much smoother. The graphics are extremely colorful, in a joy to look at. And there's new copy abilities par usual, which include wing, whip, water, and spear. Water being my favorite because Kirby can infinitely vomit out water, which is the goofiest thing I've ever seen. All the abilities have also been upgraded with multiple moves like in Superstar, so that makes all of them much more viable. You've also got the super abilities, which are visually really stunning, but they don't feel very meaningful. The experience with all of them is essentially a screen wipe. There's no small puzzles or challenges, you just do the thing and win. But hey, now there's items and objects you can pick that do extra stuff. This French horn gives you a prism shield for, uh, reasons, and the bosses are also slightly harder than normal, which is definitely appreciated. There's definitely some interesting things happening in Return to Dreamland, including the sub-games. There's the typical extra mode, which is a harder version of the main game, although this one adds a brand new boss called Metal General X. The arena and the true arena return, which are just boss rushes like a lot of Kirby games have. The sub-games are pretty interesting this time around, too. Ninja Dojo has you throwing ninja stars with your Wiimote to hit targets, Scoop Shot is shooting a bunch of robots, and challenge involves you reaching the goal with the highest score possible. What's distinct is you have to use one copy ability the whole time, and you'll almost speedrun the levels. These are all pretty fun sub-games, and it's no surprise two of them use motion controls because this was the Wii era. While Return to Dream Land is fun enough, it really doesn't do much to stand on its own. 7. Kirby and the Amazing Mirror This is probably the most memorable Kirby title for me, simply because I grew up with it and still remember my dad buying it for me when I was like 11 or 12. It may look like a traditional Kirby game, but it has a more open-world approach. It's almost Metroidvania-esque in a sense. I wouldn't quite call it that, but it has some of those elements like hidden items that require specific abilities to get to, as well as multiple map screens. The gameplay is pretty fluid and it controls well. All the usual copy abilities are here, and there's one new one called Smash. This one 
one gives you the move set from Super Smash Bros. Melee, and you obtain it by sucking up Master or Crazy Hand. That is genuinely amazing, and I wish it was featured more regularly. One of the few gimmicks is the ability to play with four different Kirbys. This can be done with real people, or you can call your pals via a cell phone. And yes, your phone has a real-time battery and it can drain to nothing unless you find batteries around the levels. But anyway, you'll rarely use all four Kirbys unless you're trying to move a giant rock or something. They're mostly just walking around the game on their own, which I guess is kind of neat to an extent. Each world looks really nice, and the pixel art has aged very well. It's such a joy running around trying to find new areas to explore. However, that is also one of the biggest flaws. Actually finding new areas can sometimes be frustrating, even with the map. A lot of times you'll need a specific ability, and if you don't have it, you have to go back and get it, and then return without losing that ability. I do wish you could swap abilities on the fly, but that would definitely make the game too easy, so I'm not really sure what workaround could have been done, aside from assuring the required enemy was always nearby. But frankly, I never really minded some backtracking. The game itself is just so enjoyable, and the music is really memorable. All of Ocean has a killer percussion backing, Moonlight Mansion has a mysterious aura to it, Rainbow Route's soft yet strong beat has an enticing charm. I really like collecting all the paint cans too, which let you change the color of Kirby. It's just a visual game, and it's in other games too, but this was before video games made you pay money to change your color palette, and the sub games are fine as well. There's not much to write home about, but Kirby Wave Ride is a solid one out of the bunch. The only thing I have to say is that the mirror ability isn't in Kirby in the Amazing Mirror, which was the ultimate missed opportunity. 6. Kirby Triple Deluxe Ah yes, this was the game that got me back into the Kirby franchise. I skipped out on the GameCube and Wii era, and was pleasantly surprised with how enjoyable this adventure was. You're doing a lot of the same kind of run and dance again, but now you have the power of the Hypernova Suck. Kirby turns all rainbow, which lets you suck up abilities and even massive objects like trees or snowballs. What I like about Hypernova is that it isn't just a screen wipe ability, a lot of times it has more purpose for getting past obstacles to complete levels, and honestly, just watching stuff get swirled into Kirby's mouth is really satisfying on its own. Of all the gimmicks Kirby has gotten over the years, this is one of the better ones. Something Triple Deluxe nails is the level design. It's excellent, and is always throwing new and interesting ideas in your face. Speaking of being in your face, you're able to jump from the foreground to background, which I'm guessing exists because Triple Deluxe is on the 3DS. There's a tiny bit of motion controls in the game too, but their appearance is so nominal that it's hard to remember you even use them. Par usual, we've got some new abilities, and these include Archer, Beetle, Bell, and Circus. I actually really like all of them, even Circus, which is just super goofy. The final boss is worth mentioning too because it's so damn cool. Queen Sectonia is this massive bee that has multiple attack patterns. The things that happen in these phases though are just so unexpected, and by the end, you suck up her literal laser attack that was meant to kill you. That is nuts. The side modes this time around are a bit more addicting and filled out. We've got DDD's Tour, Kirby Fighters, DDD's Drum Dash, and the Arena. DDD Tour is definitely the best of the bunch and is unlocked after beating the main story. You play through a compressed version of the main game as King DDD, and he's actually really fun to use. There's also Kirby Fighters and DDD's Drum Dash, which are both games you've heard a lot about already. The Arena is a boss rush mode, and the true arena is the same but more difficult. I love how you're given Maxim Tomatoes in between battles too. It's kind of like All-Star mode in Smash Bros. But yeah, Overall, Triple Deluxe is a pretty fun title with pretty decent side modes to boot. 5. Kirby in the Forgotten Land After all of this time, Kirby finally gets a proper 3D game, and it's by far one of the best Kirby titles I've ever played. First off, the presentation is just phenomenal. Parts of this game almost look like something coming from a PS4 or PS5 game. At least the cutscenes are like that. The game itself still looks great, despite a lot of enemies having weird frame rate issues. Sometimes when enemies are far away, the frame rate is chopped considerably, almost looking like a claymation. But strangely, this is kind of charming, and I can't really put my finger on why. Kirby also has very fluid movement. He's fun to just move around with and spin in a bunch of circles. The gameplay itself is still pretty similar to a normal Kirby game. You inhale enemies to take their abilities to clear levels. This game is more of a collect-a-thon, however. You have to rescue a bunch of Waddle Dees while clearing each level. A lot of the Waddle Dees and other collectibles are hidden well, so you're heavily encouraged to explore and are often rewarded for looking around with things like coins or trophies. The Waddle Dees 
unlock the bosses, which by the way are some of the best boss fights Kirby has ever had. Clawreline and Silly Dillo are highlights for having some really cool and fun attack patterns. I love how Kirby's roll slows down in time when you're close to getting hit by the way. Not only does it look badass, but it's helpful for leading yourself to safety. Now of course I have to mention Mouthful Mode. We've all seen what Kirby looks like and it is freaking hilarious. I also love the staircase and water balloon Kirby. He just looks so goofy and endearing. So while I like all the random things Kirby can eat, there are a few of them that have virtually no purpose, such as story mode. Kirby opens up an area, and that's about it. It's still cute watching him get through levels like this, but some of these objects that he inhales don't do much. It's like the Cactus Retreat in Mario Odyssey. It just kind of exists for one objective and nothing more. One of my favorite new things is the fact that you can upgrade your abilities. You'll do this with the coins and rare stones you collect throughout each level, so combing through the levels is heavily encouraged. So while there may only be 12 abilities, they can upgrade up to two to four times, so there's technically more abilities than most most Kirby games. I especially loved fully upgrading Ranger. Charged up shots are ridiculously broken and you can take out small bosses in like 5 seconds flat. Ranger is also just a new ability in general. Basically, it's Kirby with a gun. Controlling this is very weird at first since you have to manually aim your charged shots, but it's pretty easy to get used to. The drill ability is also new, which reminds me a lot of the animal ability from Squeak Squad, but it's honestly a lot better. Waddle Dee Town is pretty incredible as well. This is where you'll play the sub games, upgrade your abilities, and buy health items. Which by the way, you can now store one of them for levels. It's not really necessary since the game is still pretty easy, but it's still a nice feature to have. I'm also obligated to mention the fishing game, and it is absolutely adorable. Look at that little hat, what a Chad Puff boy. You've also got the Waddle Dee Cafe and Tilt and Roll Kirby, but like most sub games, you play them a few times and you're done with them. The final bosses are also insane, but since this game is still pretty new, I won't show them. I'll just say that it is up there with the same insanity as, say, Planet Robobot. So with that said, this game is awesome, and is definitely worth playing if you've ever enjoyed any Kirby game in the past. At this point, I'd be really curious to see a proper open world Kirby title. That would be an incredible step, and one that Kirby could definitely pursue now that General 3D works so well. Four. Kirby Superstar. Damn, this game means business. That was impressive for SNES standards. As someone that's been a Kirby fan for many years, I never got around to playing Kirby Superstar, despite hearing it was the best game in the entire series. So I had high expectations going in, and while I don't think it's the best one, it does a lot right and really helped define who Kirby has become today. So Superstar claims it has eight games in one, while well, technically there's nine, and honestly, half of these games are somewhat tied together while being kind of broken up into chapters. Spring Breeze, Dynablade, Revenge of Meta Knight, and Milky Way Wishes could have all been grouped together and still keep the changes they do have, but it doesn't really matter that much. Spring Breeze recreates Kirby's Dream Land 1 from the ground up while adding in copy abilities. Dynablade is split into five stages, and you fight the massive bird at the end. Revenge of Meta Knight has you traversing Halberd and ending by fighting Meta Knight while the ship is falling. And finally, Milky Way Wishes has you traveling from planet to planet to prevent the sun and moon from fighting. All of these modes are the best part of the game, and really did a lot to advance the Kirby franchise. For one, all the Kirby abilities have hats now. You can perform multiple attacks with one ability, and they also introduce partner characters. Some people don't like this mechanic because the partners tend to be stupid and aren't very helpful, but honestly, I kind of like that they only help a little bit. They only take the edge off the difficulty. And look, we're playing a Kirby game anyway, so it's not that difficult to begin with. Out of all these core modes, Revenge of Meta Knight is by far the best. The music just absolutely slaps. It makes you feel like a badass spy sneaking into an evil villain's camp just cleaning up their guards. You're also on a time limit, so you're encouraged to play fast, which will garner more mistakes, only adding to a sense of intensity. I also love how the commanders of the ship are talking back and forth. Reading their text as you're soaring through the ship adds this strange sense of immersiveness, especially because you see their cockiness at the beginning, and by the end, they all abandon ship. It's a very real-feeling scenario. Milky Way Wishes does something really weird, in that you can't suck up enemies for copy abilities. You have to find the copy essences instead, which is much harder to 
do. While I liked a lot of this mode, especially the computer virus boss for how freaking creative it is, a lot of the levels were just irritating. Especially Hotbeat. It seemed impossible to avoid taking damage sometimes. This is kind of a recurring problem in this game, in which enemies will spawn on top of you after entering a new door, or they come from off screen too fast and you can't react in time. This issue doesn't ruin the game or anything, but I did notice it happens somewhat frequently. Before talking about the other game modes, I should mention that Kirby Superstar introduced 13 new abilities. That is just nutty, and one of them is Mirror. This has to be one of the best power-ups. I found a strat against the computer virus where by spamming B, I would deflect all the boss's attacks almost every time. It's hilariously broken. But anyway, there's also the Gourmet Race, where you have to eat more food than King DDD and finish the level before him. This was very short-lived, but a lot of fun. The Great Cave Offensive is a massive maze in which you run through and have to find all 60 treasures. This one is really fun too and actually feels different to most of the modes. I especially enjoyed finding the save areas for the first time, because I had no idea that the music for Smash Bros. Melee's All-Star mode came from this game until playing it. At the end, you unlock the arena, and there's also two small sub-games. There's not much to say about these. For Megaton Punch, you just have to time your button press to crack Planet Popstar, and Samurai Kirby is pushing a button before your enemy. So all in all, Kirby Superstar is pretty fantastic for what it brings to the table. 3. Kirby Superstar Ultra It's by far the ultra version of the original SNES Classic. Although I do have to say, the intro is not nearly as good. They just can't match that super smooth looking pixel art with compressed 3D, but that's besides the point. While this is technically the same game, it really adds a lot of new stuff to make it so much better. And not even just the new modes, but the main games are vastly improved too. One of my biggest issues was the screen having trouble scrolling fast enough. And now that I've played this version, the SNES version was kind of laggy. Superstar Ultra no longer has that screen scrolling issue, and it runs way better. Plus, the maps are more zoomed out so you can see what's coming up much easier now. There's really nothing bad to say about the main games. They've all been enhanced to a higher pedigree, and they were already pretty fun before. New to the game are a few sub-games and a couple of other modes. And these sub-games are fine. Kirby Card Swipe just has you picking the right card before everyone else, Kirby on the Draw is a touchscreen shooter, and Snack Tracks has you eating a lot of food while tapping away worms and bombs. I like Snack Tracks the most, but like most sub-games, they are entertaining for long. However, the other new game modes are pretty awesome. The true arena is just like the arena, although it's more difficult, adds more bosses, yada yada yada. The boss rushes are just meh to me, but for those looking for something challenging to sink their teeth into, you'll definitely find it here. There's also Helper to Hero, which is a boss rush, but you play as the helpers instead. I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would. It kind of reminded me of Kirby Star Allies. Revenge of the King is a remake of the extra mode in Kirby's Dream Land, so once again, you play through the remake. Playing Kirby's Dream Land 1 this much is starting to get a little tiring, but at least this mode is a little tougher, and the new final boss makes it worth it. You fight Mass King DDD, and he has this huge hammer and you're in a cage, and the music is way better than it has any right to be. Meta Nightmare Ultra is the best new thing. You play through all the main games as Meta Knight and try to speed through them as fast as you can. This isn't a new idea, but I like it in the other Kirby games, so I really like it here too. The original Superstar is a classic, but Superstar Ultra does nothing but make improvements. 2. Kirby's Dream Collection Special Edition I think I'm actually having a dream, because this is one of the best, if not the best collections Nintendo has ever produced. They put so much love and care into Kirby's 20th anniversary, it really makes me wish they did the same for Mario and Zelda. So Dream Collection's main selling point is six ports. Kirby's Dream Land, Kirby's Adventure, Kirby's Dream Land 2, Kirby's Superstar, Kirby's Dream Land 3, and Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards. All these titles are fairly varied, so if you've never played any of them, this is an amazing value on its own. The games run about the same as they do on the original hardware, although I did notice that Kirby 64 seems to be a bit smoother. I'm slightly disappointed they didn't fix the lag in Kirby's Adventure, but that's such a tiny nitpick to what's already an amazing compilation. Something I did find kind of weird was that there isn't a way to go back to the classic titles menu. You have to reset the entire game to play something else. I even checked the instruction manual, and there doesn't seem to be any other way around this. Besides that, there's new challenges, which are basically a small selection of new levels using Return to Dream Land's engine. These are actually pretty fun. I especially enjoyed Magalore's race stages. They reminded me a lot of Gourmet Race. The most interesting aspect of this mode is that you can use the Smash copy ability. This wasn't in Kirby Return to Dream Land. It was created just for this collection. That is insanely cool and a level of dedication I wouldn't have expected. Finally, there's Kirby's History, which takes us through most of Kirby's old games by here. To get more info on each game, you have to suck it up, which is just awesome. And then you can move the box art around and watch bonus videos showing 
ongoing gameplay. It's also worth reading all the excerpts for each year because for some reason, we're given facts on a lot of real world events like George Bush becoming president or when the Olympics happened or Intel releasing its first Pentium processor. As random as it may seem, it really goes to show that HAL Laboratory knows that Kirby is nothing more than a fun game. And they probably wanted to educate kids on these important events. The coolest thing by far is we can watch three episodes of Kirby right back at you right on the disc. They picked episodes 1, 60, and 72. Not sure why they didn't stick with episodes 1 through 3, but whatever, I can't complain. And at the end of the hallway, you can suck up Kirby's Dream Collection and watch a live performance of Kirby music. They genuinely went all out here. And there's even physical stuff included. This celebration book goes into more detail with the games, showing off early concept art, a print gallery, and revealing unused content. Finally, there's a CD with 45 Kirby songs. And since I can't play them on a Wii, I guess I'll just use the CDI. One. Kirby Planet Robobot. I can't believe I've waited to play this game until now. I was missing out on a truly incredible time. It's unlike any of the other Kirby titles as you'll take control of giant mechs. That alone is pretty sweet, but what's even better is the suit can scan enemies for its own copy abilities. I mean, just holy sh**. What a genius idea and it's utilized perfectly. When inside the Robobot armor, your attacks are a lot stronger and can break bigger objects and stuff, but the Robot suit is also used for a large portion of puzzles. Because of these elements, it gives Robobot armor a lot of meaning and value. A lot of the puzzles you'll solve are for the code cubes, as you need a certain amount of these to get to each level's boss. A lot of the bosses strangely come from Kirby's Dream Land 2, which is a bit random, but the fan service is very much appreciated. The final boss is goddamn insane, by the way. You take on President Haltman in this bizarre subspace world, then Haltman tries to control Star Dream with a helmet, Susie comes out of nowhere and snatches it from him to sell for profit, the robot becomes sentient and flies away, Kirby turns into the mother f***ing halberd using the Robobot armor, and yes, I am dead serious, you turn into the halberd and you fight Star Dream in space. I don't know how the hell you can top a fight like this. The whole thing is just insane, and the space shooter segment is a blast from start to finish. I especially love wheel mode since you can literally jump from the foreground and background instead of taking a warp star. I'm just genuinely blown away at how many new and cool things this game has. And speaking of, there's a few new copy abilities on top of that. My favorite being Doctor because Kirby gets these huge adorable blue glasses. Look at him. And one of his attacks is with a clipboard. Like, you, you just, you can't beat that. I'm sorry. There's also Amiibo support, but they don't really do much. You can get some exclusive skins for Waddle D, Meta Knight, and King DDD, as well as easier access to the UFO and Smash Bros. copy ability. I haven't even brought up the locations yet. They're also incredible because they're actually new and interesting. You've got Resolution Road, a busy city in which Kirby runs across the street and through casinos and the like. The Waddle Dees even stop when there's a red light. But good lads, Gigabyte Grounds is a mechanized desert. Access Arc is a massive mothership. It's so nice to see varied and distinct locations. The music is just amazing par usual. A lot of it features remixes from previous Kirby games with my favorite being the boss music from Kirby 64. And finally, there's all the sub games. Kirby 3D Rumble, well, you kind of already know what that is. And then of course there's Team Kirby Clash, again, same thing. Meta Nightmare makes a return and so does the arena in the true arena. They're all just as fun as ever. I guess the last thing to mention is you can put your collected stickers on the Robobots. That's pretty goofy, but I guess that's a reason to find them all. Look, if you ever play one Kirby game in your entire life, make it this one. Man, that sure was a lot of Kirby. This is an incredibly wholesome and creative franchise, and I'm always looking forward to seeing what the Pink Puffball does next. Until next time!